All right, man. Welcome to the introduction for episode 85, Crow 777 Radio Podcast. Jason Lindgren was, is with me, and we will be talking about the sneaky old moon, uh, among other things. And before I get started, transcripts are now, now available when you're logged in as a member um, on Crow777Radio.com. But let's talk about information for a second. So much of this episode, the space episodes we've done in the past, matter of fact, so many of the episodes in general have to do with information in the modern age and what people are faced with when they're given information. In one way, the information age has put so much at our fingertips, but in another way, it's a bit of a mind trap. Um, I'm going to run an article that I wrote a long time ago. Jason's going to read it uh, last couple minutes, and it addresses how people deal with information and the possible pitfalls and mind traps that come along with information. After all, every time you are confronted with information, uh, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, you're faced with a decision. Um, there's no way around it. Now, I have allegorized this to the alchemical means uh, that I believe are employed uh, with information in the modern age. So much of the false news cycles and other things that we're faced with depend on a kind of a mind trap where, well, let me back up for a second. Back in the day, let's use this as an example. Back in the day in the 60s when people were shown the moon landings, they got one shot at it. Um, not only did they get one shot at it, the quality of the imagery they were being given and the information was not that great. There was really no way to record it for most people, and they were at the mercy of whatever their television set was going to show them. And based on that, they were forced to make a decision. That's going to have a huge bearing on some of the things we cover here. But anyhow, let's jump in, and I'm going to preface again. Jason is going to read an article about the alchemical crossroads, which has directly to do with the modern information age and how people are constantly forced to make a decision at the crossroad when information is presented. Anyhow, let's jump in quickly with Jason, followed by the episode. Cheers. I went down to the crossroads and left walking. Date, June 23, 2017, Summer Solstice 2017. Oh, my friends, look to the sun. It encodes so much before the day is done. After dark, look to moon and sky, knowing well that each of us dies. Are these things we see made by men? Consider this often, time and again. Crow. I am writing this article because so many people lose hope and become overwhelmed by the realities that are now shedding their veils. I am here to tell you there is no reason to despair. We are simply in a time of change, and with it, the human mind. Make no mistake, there are people out there determined to enslave the population, but at the end of the day, it is up to us to either opt in or opt out. There is no other option unless we are fooled and all options elude us. This is no time to be fooled. This is no time for fools. It is my view that in order to understand, we must first identify that which is man-made and that which is natural. This, of course, relates to alchemy, and as fate would have it, so much of the world's mind games are driven by these very old ideas. So let's go down to the crossroads, but remain standing so that we may face the task at hand on two feet. Imagine yourself standing at a crossroad, or where two throughways cross over one another. X marks the spot, and in your mind, it should appear something like this, a cross. A decision must be made here. There is no other option. You must turn left or right, go straight or go back in the direction you came. This mental exercise may be one of the most important ideas I can impart to you, if you understand what comes next. When you are presented with information, both consciously or unconsciously, you have been brought to the crossroad and a decision must be made. But what does this mean? It means that, by its very nature, you have just been informed that information can be a mind trap. You must make a decision about the information, and even choosing not to decide is, in fact, a choice. Make the wrong choice and enter further into a fantasy-based reality, believing in that which is without reality. Make the right choice and move away from an infantile, fantastic reality that has no actual value or reality. Make the right choice and move towards fulfilling what a human being can become and may well once have been. In my view, alchemy was demonized by religion school and ridiculed as witchcraft for one reason. That reason being that alchemy is in tune with what we call nature and seeks to advance and achieve in step with our natural system. The alternative to a natural system is, of course, an artificial system, which means made by men. Unfortunately, alchemy can be used in a positive or negative way. 
using the crossroads as a mind trap, adding man-made fantasy into a natural system, is a good example of the negative application. What we call news and much of the mainstream information in this world depends on the strategy to pull the world into a fantasy-based reality. The end result for so many people is living in a dream world that is built on imagination and belief. This is why belief is the enemy of knowing. Belief is bait hiding a hook that will snag and hold your mind in fantasy, if you allow it to. The question becomes, do you want to believe in things or know about them? I could easily make a diaper-wearing pun here, but it is not really funny considering how many of us find ourselves trapped at the crossroads like diaper-wearing babies unable to even consider there is a choice to be made. And this sets aside the overwhelming manipulation of reality that awaits poor decision-makers. So how does one go about making good decisions at the crossroads? With practice, of course. First off, never forget, belief is the enemy of knowing. Secondly, consider all information as false until there is a provable reason not to. Thirdly, challenge all information regardless of source or authority. Above all, train your mind to use common sense when faced with a decision. These are not easy things to do at first, but over the course of about a year, your entire life will change and you will begin to see with new eyes. That is, if you can stick to what seems a simple thing and is not. And by the way, seeing with new eyes is simply a human being gaining human abilities. We are born with the ability to detect fraud, but have been trained at the crossroads not to understand this truth. By design, I might add. As we wrap up, let's take a look at a natural system and consider the man-made explanation for it. Let's head to the crossroads, but remain standing tall. Some years ago, I was given a tour of rare orchids at the San Diego Zoo. Backstage, so to speak. One particular orchid caught my eye as the flowers had two very long trailing tails that reached all the way to the ground many feet below. I was told that these tails were what allowed this orchid to reproduce as a specific type of insect was attracted to it and then climbed up one tail and down the other, pollinating the orchid along the way. The shape and size of this specific insect were made to order. Without this relationship between species, the orchid could not exist. Got it? We are told by science that all species of plant animal have evolved into what we currently see. So there is the artificial explanation information. But how can this be? How did the orchid reproduce before evolution created these tails allowing the insect to pollinate? This sets aside the whole evolution of the required insect to be in step with the evolution of the flower and come to form the relationship. We are told evolution requires enormous lengths of time, again begging for an explanation of how the orchid reproduced before this evolution in marriage to the insect. How can any of this be valid? Short answer, it cannot be valid as dictated by logic. But we already knew this from the time we were very young. What came first, the chicken or the egg? I cannot tell you how the orchid came to exist in the way we see it today, but I can sure as hell tell you how it did not come to exist as we see it today. I can also tell you, certainly, that the orchid came to exist in a natural system we call nature, which appears to be a perfect system from our point of view. Men do not make perfect systems, and unfortunately, most of the artificial explanations we have been given seek to keep us all in diapers. How is it possible that a world exists full of people that do not know how long we have been here, how we got here, or what we are supposed to be doing? Logic dictates a very simple answer at this particular crossroads. We have been given artificial explanations of a natural system and very likely with the intent to deceive. So when you are brought to the crossroads, will you fall down on your knees or walk away on two legs? All right, man. Welcome to Crow 777 Radio Podcast. This is episode 85. I have Jason Lindgren with me, and we're going back to the moon, as if that were possible. Um, Anyhow, welcome, Jason. Hello, Crow. Let's fly to the moon. Yeah, let's try. Anyhow, we could be the first that actually pull it off, maybe. Let's hop in the sailboat and sail the seas of cheese. (laughs) Yeah, let's let's go take apart the JFK speech and set sail on this new ocean. (laughs) Um, Anyhow, we got a number of things to cover here. So uh, as many people are aware, I'll reiterate again, uh, Crow777 on YouTube is back. It appears. This is my best guess. It appears that so many people complained about the channel termination that it was reinstated. That is the only guess I can make. And as search returns for Crow 777 began to repopulate search engines to some degree, I could actually see into complaint forums and other places. And there were just oodles and oodles of people who not only said they complained, I could see some of the complaints registered. Anything you would add to that, Jason? Let's just say uh, thank you to everyone out there. It seems that, I mean, that's the only guess I have as well, is that everyone just bitched up a storm, and that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a heck of a thing when a community is actually 
into things enough and active enough to do something like that because this type of thing matters. And, you know, all these channels that are taken out uh, and it seems like there's no good reason for it, uh, it's a wonderful thing to see when the community stands up in that way, if we're in fact correct. But I don't see how it could have gone any other way. Um, I was told flat out from two sources that the channel was not coming back. Anyhow, um, to reiterate, I do a recurring spot every Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Truth Frequency Radio with Billy Ray Valentine. Thank you for that spot, Billy. Uh, tonight, which is going to be late by the time we post this, it's Wednesday night, I'll be doing The Four Horsemen with uh, Hacker Hameen, uh, the pro wrestler who has been uh, offering me spots here and there. Both of those gentlemen are running the first hour of Crow 777 radio episodes. So thank you to you guys. Again, I'll apologize to Rents Radio Network and Studio uh, for missing the spot you had for me. I got a flu that knocked me down so hard I could literally not get up. Um, so, Mr. Rents, I apologize, and I'm happy to reschedule with you. As a matter of fact, please do. Anyhow, I think that's it, Jason, in terms of places I've been. And Oh, that's not true. Um, sometime around uh, mid-month, I've rescheduled with Greg Carlwood at Higher Side Chats, and I will be doing that show, which I also missed uh, when I was down with the flu for that couple of days. There's one more thing. I wanted to make a correction. I made a note here that's not in your notes. A long time ago, I did research on the word NASA. There were some people uh, who speak the language that it was taken from or that they were associating it with Hebrew or Yiddish, which I'm not even sure the proper way to address it, and had been stating that NASA means to deceive. I've had a couple people come in to correct me, claiming that they speak the language in a closer uh, translation to the word NASA would be to carry. So I'm not exactly sure right now. Maybe I'll take some time at some point and dig in to try to get closer to what NASA would mean uh, in the Hebraic language. Um, if anyone out there speaks it, feel free to come by the forum and uh, and maybe add to the correction. So that could be my bad. I've been using deception from old uh, research that I did. And so if I've been saying that and it's not correct, I apologize. Uh, maybe we'll get to the bottom. Of it. If I remember correctly, it doesn't. Uh, there is actually no Hebrew language, but it's actually ancient Phoenician and and some other taking from that area of way back when. It could be, Jason. The problem was is that the research that I did on it was probably over three years ago. Um, so it's so far back behind me now. I just simply don't remember. Um, what what tends to happen is I'll do research and I typically remember the outcome of whatever it is I've learned, but I don't always remember the source when we get so many years in front of it. So I need to go back, but it's not that big a deal. Um, there's going to be plenty of people out there who speak the language who can help with the correction, I'm sure. Um, you know, you can do searches. The problem with search is, is is you get what you get, and I think you may be correct um, that we may have been drawing from Phoenician. Anyhow, we'll get to the bottom of it. But anyhow, my bad if I've been stating that incorrectly. That's not a cool thing, and it should be corrected. But anyhow, back to you. Now, let's talk about censorship in a big way. In a private email you received regarding your channel when it was taken down, it was blatantly stated by YouTube that they were calling you hate speech. Now, that's a very serious charge, and I do wonder if that was a mistake on their part, because in a private conversation you and I had, I blatantly said, that could be the chink in the armor we can go after, because we're not hate speech. There's nothing here that gets put on your channel that can be misconstrued as hate speech. No, there's not. And, you know, I've made the statement, I think in the last episode alone, I made the statement twice to, to face that right off. We don't do that kind of thing. We don't hate anyone. We don't play hate speech games. There's no intent for any of that nonsense. It's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is challenging things and that there is no part of, you know, downing people or things or causing trouble or causing injury. That's never going to happen here. It's not what we do here. But um, I would point out, Jason, that we're about to cover a Yahoo article out of London of all places. So many people are beginning to make the claim that the censorship we're seeing rolling out over line is coming out of the EU. Um, the Yahoo article kind of backs that. But I would point to the full spectrum programming that's going on. We're going to see things like terrorism, violence, these types of things that have driven the censorship push. Now sex is coming into it, specifically pedophilia. Um, and I would point everyone back. I went on shows right before I got sick. I think it was anyhow, if I remember correctly, 
where there was this how to have search return that was being attributed to Google that was giving pedophile like returns. There was a whole construct around it that they couldn't fix the problem for, I don't know what it was, two days, three days, whatever it was. And the whole thing smacked of ridiculousness to me. Um, and then, of course, in the mainstream media, we began to see celebrity after celebrity after celebrity after celebrity after and I could go on here I think there's like 16 of them or something now Jason that are in trouble for sexual misconduct in one way shape or form people like Matt Lauer um, supposedly losing their jobs after God knows how many years you know two three decades whatever it's been this is all a tee up in my view uh, to begin to push the censorship so I'll let you get into it here Jason, we'll tread lightly um, because Lord only knows when we talk about things like sex or the pedophilia that was being attributed to to, to YouTube returns, um, people are going to try to make hay out of it. But I'll, we'll state right now, we're having a conversation about censorship here. That is it. That's where it begins and ends. There is no other intent here. So go ahead, Jason. From a Yahoo article that was uh, from, I believe, yesterday, Google is to deploy a staff of 10,000 to hunt down extremist content on its YouTube platform following recent criticism, the video sharing site's chief executive told Britain's Daily Telegraph Tuesday. Susan Wasicki admitted in the broadsheet that bad actors had used the website to mislead, manipulate, harass, or even harm. British Prime Minister Theresa May has put pressure on internet giants to root out online radical material following a spate of terror attacks while YouTube last week pulled 150,000 videos of children after lewd comments about them were posted by viewers. Wasiki claimed that her company had developed computer learning technology to identify extremist videos and that it could also be used to identify content that risked children's safety. We will continue the growth of our teams with the goal of bringing the total number of people across Google working to address content that might violate our policies to over 10,000 in 2018. Last week's move to take down suspect content came after a British newspaper reported that ads for big name brands were displayed alongside videos of children or teens which, while innocent on their own, drew viewer comments that seemed pedophilic in nature. Media reports indicate the situation made advertisers skittish, with some halting YouTube advertising. So there's so much here, man. Um, these are the types of things where censorship creeps in. I'm not going to tolerate comments that make any any reference to pedophilia being supported or anything like that in any way. What's going on here is there's a claim being made they're going to put 10,000 people on staff to go after this kind of what they're calling extremists. You see the language coming into it. We don't use re regular language when we're doing things that are not regular. That's extremist videos. They've taken down 150,000. But I would point out at the end of this little blurb, they're saying that it that it drew viewer comments that seem pedophilic. Well, why are you pulling videos or anything else? Why aren't you just stopping the pedophilic commenters? You see, this whole thing is backwards, and we can see where the push is going. And when we look around in the mainstream world and see just the slew of celebrity names that all of a sudden, for some reason in the fall this month, um, are in trouble for sexual misconduct, you better understand what's going on here. This is full spectrum programming. Um, for those of us who are technical and understand how computers work, um, the idea that you couldn't take down a pedophilic search return for something days is ridiculous. The idea that you can't prevent people from posting things that are pedophilic in nature, or at least stop them after the fact, is ridiculous. And what we see here is, oh, we got to take out all these videos. This is just, in my view, another backdoor, like terror, like fear, like all the things that we're going to see come to bear here to do censorship. And I would point out, and I will always maintain, the line for free speech is injury. That is the line in the sand. I grew up in the United States of America. I'm pretty familiar with what free speech has been through the decades of my lifetime, and I've done plenty of research recently to look at even the court cases that talk about what free speech is. What we're seeing here is European governments pushing corporations to abridge the free speech of Americans, among other people. I can only speak for the country with you know that I reside in. Um, it is injury. That is the line in the stand. 
back in the 70s, it was always said, you know, you can't scream fire in a crowded theater. Well, you see, that makes sense, because if you did that, people might run out of the theater and trample each other. People could be injured. Injury is the line here, Jason. And I don't think anyone can misconstrue your channel as doing something that could cause harm or injury to anyone at all. That's just poppycock. No, it's not. We we don't do that. As a matter of fact, we've stated that our intent is so far from that um, that we will challenge anyone who claims that we're taking part in hate speech or anything else. We have the right to challenge mainstream narratives. We have the right to challenge established scientific principles. We have the right to challenge anything we will, as long as we do it as adults. And that's what we've done here. Uh, no injury or no harm has been done to anyone. But, you know, this is a this is a warning shot. You know, another government saying, hey, corporation, put 10,000 people on staff to go out and find extremist content. And by the way, we have AI. This is all ridiculousness in my ears. It's not that hard for companies with this much resource and technology to simply remove a video that's a problem. It's not that much trouble if people are commenting in an inappropriate way to prevent them from com commenting. It's just not. So the idea that we're putting on a platoon or a battalion of new workers to come do this, we're removing 150,000 gig. I mean, you can see where this goes. But anyhow, Jason, I don't think we need to beat that dead horse any longer. Uh, what's next? Well, the, the idea that they can't just pull something down is, is also ludicrous because they took you down in a second. OK, we, we decided you're bad. Boom, you're down. They, they have the power to do that. And uh, they're obviously watching. Well, what's also ridiculous about it in the case of YouTube is there's a flag option. So if someone came into a forum or under a video where people were and started making pedophilic like comments, you'd be pretty sure that everyone who's there watching those comments would be flagging it pretty quickly, right? So you can see the construct of it all. And again, I will point to what mainstream media is doing right now. They're just blitzing the airwaves with all of a sudden, for some reason, all these famous people have sexual misconduct problems. It's it's all a bit much, Jason. It is all a bit much for the adult higher mind. But anyhow, man, uh, I don't think we need to go down this road anymore. Censorship is a big damn deal. Freedom of speech is a big damn deal. And the question will become here, do we have the right to challenge mainstream narratives? Do we? I will maintain to the day I drop that we do. I will maintain to the day we drop, we have free speech as a natural born right as long as we're not harming anyone. Um, these are tenants that are backed by court cases and decades and decades in this country, anyhow, of people who have gone at the ideas of free speech. But anyhow, Jason. And did they remove the strikes that uh, took your channel out? No, they did not. When I first logged in after they had taken me down and I got that bizarre kind of zeroed out account with basically 78,000 subs attached to it, there were no strikes. But the next morning when everything was back, in fact, I did get the two, the two community guideline strikes back again. And, you know, that's a telling thing in itself, too, because there were other copyright issues on Internet, on, uh, I'm sorry, International Space Station video, two of them. Well, those were both copyrights, but I didn't get strikes. They just removed the videos. So it's so arbitrary as to be ridiculous. Um, if a video is a problem, you can remove it. Why do you need to remove five years of someone's work, thousands of hours? Um, in my case, an actual factual based history of, televis of telescopic observation over all those years. Um, you can see what's going on here. It, it, none, it, it turns common sense on its head. If a video is truly, a pro, a, a, truly legitimately a problem, remove it. What's the big deal? If they keep doing the same thing over and it's truly a problem, warn them. Um, at some point, if they cross the line, that's a whole other thing. But that's not really what we're seeing here. And again, um, it is truly stunning, truly stunning, the ease with which Google will wipe out a channel with an 80,000 user base community and Lord knows how many thousands of hours of work, telescopic observation in my case, it is astounding that we have come to this and that seems okay to anybody because to me, it seems so far from okay, I don't even know what to say about it. But anyhow, Jason, we're here to address the moon today. You wanna jump into it. So obviously we did a lot of work early on in our tenure together on space fraud and attacking everything that's been sent to us from governmental agencies that seem to have a whole lot of poppycock in them. So 
we're going to address the moon again because we haven't discussed anything with space in quite a while and try and get get some different angles in there. Uh, a lot of media stuff, that sort of thing. Now, to start off with, we're going to look at the fact that in certain ancient philosophies, there is reported a time where there was no moon in the sky. Early Greek philosophers discuss even earlier peoples than them in their region who dwelt there at a time before there was supposedly a moon in the sky. Names used for these people were Pelasgians, Proselenes, and Arcadians. Apollonius of Rhodes, the Greek writer from around 3rd century BCE, he's the one who authored the poem Argonautica, which told the story of Jason and the Argonauts and their quest for the Golden Fleece that I'm sure most people are familiar with, mentioned the time when not all the orbs were yet in the heavens, before the Danai and Deucalion races came into existence, and only the Arcadians lived, of whom it is said that they dwelt on mountains and fed on acorns before there was a moon. The memory of a moonless earth is contained in the oral traditions of such Indians as those of the Bogota Highlands as well, uh, in the eastern Cordilleras of Colombia. According to tribesmen of Chibchas, in the earliest times when the moon was not yet in the heavens. Now, who knows how long ago this truly would have been, if there's any truth to it, but there exists works of art that have been found from ancient man with depictions of a moon in the sky. Right. Um, we had covered this, and I had done shows and actually some articles early on about the idea of a time when the moon was not in our sky. And from the South American areas that you referenced, there are even tribes whose names basically mean uh, those who lived before there was a moon. As a matter of fact, I think the Proselenes, I may have this wrong, Jason, but it's a name like that or that one there, a version of that, which means a similar thing. Um, these ideas are actually quite widespread. They're just not easy to dig up at this point. And the reason I think that this is a critical point to make is because I have said for a long time that we're living in a construct. I have said for a long time that I think the moon has directly to do with our death. Um, I think there's something to this. This is not an easy thing to demonstrate. And to the average year, when you begin to talk about things like this, they probably shut down their brain pretty quickly uh, because it's so far from any sense of normal uh, to the average mind. But I think it's important that we put this out and I think it's important that we cover it because as we get into the ideas of supposedly going to the moon and 50 years later, we still haven't. There's still no moon base. You start to reason all these things through and you begin to realize that the things that you have been told simply do not hold water. Logically, commonsensically, they do not hold water. But anyhow, back to you. So it seemed the moon existed long enough in the sky to be a huge inspiration on many ancient cultures' mythology, with various gods and goddesses being attributed to the moon. Now, the name attributed to the moon today is Luna, which is Latin, and this name comes from the ancient Roman pantheon. In ancient Roman religion and mythology, Luna is the divine embodiment of the moon. She is often presented as the female complement of the sun, called Sol, conceived of as a god. Luna is also sometimes represented as an aspect of the Roman triple goddess, and here we see the vast importance of a triune god form again, along with Proserpina and Hecate. Luna is not always represented as a distinct goddess, but sometimes as a descriptor of sorts that specializes on a goddess, since both Diana and Juno are both identified as moon goddesses as well. A common depiction you will see of Luna will have the crescent horns on her head, very similar to Moses, who is also a moon god, and many other from various cultures' mythos. Always the moon, always the crescent on the head. Right. And so before I address this, I'm going to back up one because you mentioned Jason and the Argonauts and the Golden Fleece, which is actually encoding the sun. Helios being the, the root word for the, the word healing there. Um, but to get back to this, what you're going to find here is that every culture has the idea of mythologies and goddesses and gods that are associated with sun and moon. Almost always the moon is feminine in aspect. Uh, quite often, particularly in the modern Western world, the moon has a lot to do with insanity, um, lunatic, uh, sleep, and death. But in terms of even looking at like China, here's an interesting thing to think about. Back in the Apollo missions, one of the supposed astronauts named Colin, uh, you can look this up in a transcript. I wanted to reprint it on, uh, on one of the videos I did, but apparently it is not legal to reprint transcripts for astronauts without violating copyright. 
um, or at least that particular one that I looked up because it was labeled as such. Um, he's talking about the Chinese myth of Utu the rabbit or Utu the rabbit. Uh, I've forgotten the name of, of the, the feminine deity who steals the pill of immortality and is on the moon. And Colin says something or is told, you know, look out for the, the lady on the moon next to the rabbit sitting under the cinnamon tree and they laugh it off. Well, the reason I'm bringing this up, because all these years later, after the Apollo missions, the Chinese come onto the stage claiming they're going to put something on the moon. And they name the little rover Utu. There's the rabbit from the myth Collins was referencing from the Chinese tradition of myth and magic and the moon. And, of course, the whole narrative that was being bandied about in the Apollo missions is wrapped up in all the names that go around the mission of the Chinese mission. So you can see when you begin to look at what's going on here. But I would suggest that the important bits of these stories are actually buried within the myths that go with them. As an example, if you were to look at the Chinese mission and go take apart the tale of Utu the rabbit and the girl whose name I can't remember, the, the divinity uh, that stole the pill of immortality and is banished to the moon, again, we have the idea of never dying from this person who steals the immortality pill, but then is banished to the moon who is always associated with death. Obviously, like you were just saying, there's a lot of cultures that have different aspects that seem to have a lot of similarity interwoven through them. Right. I mean, if you're if you're to come to the modern era and look at Western media, movies and other things, and I've mentioned this so many times, one of the common threads, particularly in the black and white movies from the, the golden era of Hollywood movies, you'll quite often see a person lose their life the camera will quickly flash to the moon. And I mean quickly, quite often, it's only a few frames or less than five seconds a lot of times. I was referencing this back in the day and paid attention to it for a while. And then the next scene, there's a baby being born. This is gonna play into the, the ideas of why we're covering the moon now are going to play into the next episode we do, which has to do with population. But anyhow, I won't tip the boat on that one yet, Jason. Okay, so the next one we're going to talk about is something I actually, for whatever reason, just never came across, and that's something called Project Horizon. I went through the documents and uh, read some, some write-ups on it, and I don't know what to make of this because it seems like almost ridiculous what they had in mind at this time in 1959. But anyway, here we go. A study to determine the feasibility of constructing a scientific military base on the moon. On June 8th, 1959, a group at the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, the ABMA, produced for the U.S. Department of the Army a report entitled Project Horizon, a U.S. Army study for the establishment of a lunar military outpost. The project proposal states the requirements as, the lunar outpost is required to develop and protect potential United States interests on the moon, to develop techniques in moon-based surveillance of the Earth and space, in communications relay, and in operations on the surface of the moon to serve as a base for exploration of the moon, for further exploration into space, and for military operations on the moon if required, and to support scientific investigations on the moon. The permanent outpost was predicted to cost $6 billion and become operational in December 1966 with 12 soldiers. Werner von Braun, head of ABMA, appointed Heinz Hermann Kohl to head the project team at Redstone Arsenal. Plans called for 147 early Saturn A-class rocket launches to loft spacecraft components for assembly in low Earth orbit at a spent tank space station. A lunar landing and return vehicle would have shuttled up to 16 astronauts at a time to the base and back. Horizon never progressed past the feasibility stage in an official capacity. So here we go, man, all the way back to 1959. That's a long time ago. We'll just call it 1960 because we're halfway through that year in June anyhow. So if we consider 1960, um, all this time, you know, you've been told we're going back to the moon. We're doing all these things. We're going to make bases. We're going to use it as a jump point to go to Mars. And what's actually happened? Well, I would suggest to you that not a damn thing has happened. The narrative that we've been handed is this. In 1968, they decided they were going to put people on the moon and return them safely back. Guess what? By 1969, we are told they did that. So without all the modern technology we currently have at our disposal, they supposedly put on the drawing board, executed a trip to the moon and back with men in rockets and other type of tinfoil vehicles. And uh, I would ask you. What does common sense dictate about that narrative all these years forward when, one, no one's been back, two, they've abolished the space 
the, the, the apparent space program that put them on the moon was apparently partially abolished because we're told the American people didn't take interest anymore. By the way, they did the same thing with the shuttle program. As they were beginning the shuttle program, um, the, the news, the mainstream news, was already pushing the narrative that pretty soon the media wouldn't even care when there was a launch because it would be so commonplace. But you see, they replaced the Apollo missions with the shuttle missions, and they were saying that it was going to save all this money. Fact is, it cost many times more money, and the main goal was to do all this science. I will ask everyone listening, have you ever heard of one shred of amazing science that was done by the supposed shuttle missions and the International Space Station? But when we take this back to where I began here in roughly a year, a year and a half, in the 60s, they set out to go to the moon, put a person there and bring them back safely. They say they did it. Now, here we are over 50 years down the road, not only have we not been back, not only is there no plan to put space stations there, um, can you see the issues that any logical person can uh, at face value detect with what we're being told here? For one thing, in 59, they're acting like it's a military need, an asset. And in any military situation, any person who has a brain understands the military wants the high ground. The, the moon is not only the ultimate high ground, but it's always got the same face pointed towards us. So if it was possible to land on the moon, which I maintain it is not, um, you would have the perfect platform for someone to get the ultimate high ground. And instead, what we keep seeing is these narratives handed us over and over where we're going back to the moon. As Madger Bush the Jr. at one point got astronauts on camera with him to say we're going back to the moon. Well, what happened to that? Nothing. Now we're going to Mars and they keep kicking that can down the road. So I'm just pointing out the obvious problems with the narratives we've been handed. I'm not necessarily going to dig in and and try to expose them one way or another why these narratives are false, but simply show you the logical conundrum that has been laid before us. So there it is, Jason. You know, that even just looking at this, obviously Werner von Braun was part of all of this stuff. And, uh, you know, he lived all the way until 1977, and we have this problem today that they say they don't have any of the technology from the Apollo era to, to rely on. Well, I've been watching old videos of this, and it's obvious he was teaching other people. He had students under him, people that he was passing on his knowledge. So whatever he had to do with the Saturn program had to have been passed on somewhere. You're trying to tell me none of these people know anything? Well... <laughs> and it was all destroyed, and they're, they're, they can't even say anything about it. I mean, it just that alone seems infeasible and ridiculous. Well, I can address some of this. And, of course, Mr. Werner von Braun was always with Disney and the Disney st studios. Well, Disney told us what was next in space, showing all this elaborate stuff, which more cl closely resembles the movie 2001 than any real thing we've ever seen. But, you know, Mr. Werner von Braun, we are told, almost single-handedly designed some of the rockets, the Saturn rockets and other things. And you see, the thing about that is, Jason, is if you do look up on that now, you'll be told that the rockets we're using now have changed little since the time Werner apparently designed them. So, you know, you see more logical holes in, in what we're being told here about uh, the abilities that we have. And I've said time and time again, uh, nothing leaves low Earth atmosphere, in my view, not man or machine. Um, I still have a call out. Anyone who wants to show a complete launch of something either coming back into our atmosphere or leaving our atmosphere, and I'm not talking about one of these cheesy mocked up videos where there's supposedly a camera on the outside of the rocket. Um, those have been taken apart. I'm talking about a person on a ground base observation watching this go down all the way or the reverse of that coming back in. Uh, it doesn't exist. And you see, there's a problem with all this. If we truly, for the first time, began to get into space all those decades ago, how come we don't have footage of some of the greatest achievements ever? Why is the original footage of the moon landings and the Apollo endeavors, why is that all gone now? It's all telling us a tale that really doesn't need to be explained too thoroughly. It's not even just the, the amount of photographic evidence that's missing. All of the telemetry data, 100% of it, is gone. That is invaluable information that if indeed there was some sort of modern space program trying to get out beyond Earth, you would need all that. You would use all that. You could punch that into a modern computer and, and it'd be absolutely priceless. And that is also missing. So all we have to go on are, the, are whatever we see on TV, 
of what they did, and that's all that remains. You know, it's just it's absolutely infeasible that 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 this is what really happened. They lost everything. Well, it's it's beyond the pale, Jason, and it goes to show you that it's better to get caught in situations like that than actually have someone get their hands on the ev evidence in the modern day. Um, so much of the NASA imagery and other things we've been handed, I've simply put them in Photoshop and, and shown people that these are complete edited constructs, that there is no image of anything from space based anywhere. Um, you know, we started not too long ago taking apart the, uh, the images of supposed Earth from space. Uh, the Apollo 16, Apollo 17, where we're told a Hasselblad was pointed out the window of a capsule while they were in space to shoot the world. And then all the way up to the 2002 supposed blue marble image that went out as a uh, desktop on the new iPhones at the time to program into everyone into thinking. We even know the name of that artist, of course. His name is Simmons, claiming that NASA gave him data and he created image the way he thought it should look to represent Earth. These are not arguable things. You know, these images are being passed off in a way that makes everyone think, hey, man, this is a picture of our world from space, when in fact they're not. It's demonstrably not. In the case of the uh, Apollo 17 image, they gave the time, I think there were three images or something like that, taken back to back to back, and they stated the time. Well, years later on the internet, people took that time and they rolled the clock forward to discover that the wrong portion of the earth is lit. That is what reflected in those images. That sets aside all the cloned clouds that have been identified. The fact that the Apollo 17 and 16 land masses and sizes don't jive, nor do they fit with the geo geodetic survey uh, information that's available here on Earth, um, all these problems, and yet we still, in the modern age, have so many people who are convinced that there is a there there. Whether or not there's a there there, I would suggest that we haven't been told a single thing about it. We can imagine, because we've watched Star Wars, what it might be. We can imagine, because Star Trek was on in the 60s, what it might be. But we ain't never seen a shred of real photographic evidence. Um, that's where I'm coming from here. And when we begin to consider that all the way up past the 2000s, why is it that we don't have constant cameras on the moon or in space or any number of places that would constantly give us this HD amazing footage? And the reason for that is... Um, is my fallback because we've never sent anything above our atmosphere in my view. So there it is, Jason. Now, out of sheer curiosity, from your point of view as an experienced photographer, if we work in the framework of the mainstream notion of space and the planets and everything, if you were in a capsule on your way to the moon and you stuck a camera out the window of your little Apollo-like capsule and took a picture, would it be visible? Would it be perfectly normal looking or is there actually a need for the way things might be perceived that you'd have to do these constructs that we're always catching them doing? Why? I mean, all we can do is use common sense to relate that because I don't accept the definitions of space. People who followed me understand um, the work that I've done has led me to believe that space is probably closer to some kind of a liquid um, and that there's some sort of a hard, fast barrier at what we would call low Earth orbit. Um, if we're driving in a car and we put a camera up to the window, can we take a picture of things outside at night that are lit? I guess I would ask that. The answer is yes, we can do these things. So um, it doesn't really matter whether or not they could actually be done in some construct that's going to get described to us. We're, we were told it happened, Jason. On Apollo 16 and 17, the claim is they put the Hasselblad up to the window, and that's how we got uh, the images of Earth from space that have been debunked so thoroughly. So really, to me, the main tell is not to technically go out whether this would be possible in the construct we've been handed. Um, it's simple. We were told it did happen, and the evidence that we got back from that doesn't hold a drop of water. Not a drop. Anyhow, man. So let's talk about the lunar exploration timeline, and this is predominantly until the very end what the United States says they were doing as well as the Soviet Union. Now, of course, we have the first rockets coming about at the end of World War II with Nazi Germany, and that's, of course, where Werner von Braun came from. And in 1948, you have a V-2, a recovered V-2, being used to get an early photo of the Earth. And that one looks really distinct and clear, in my opinion, even though it's black and white, compared to a lot of the stuff that you see later. So interesting there, I thought. But the United States, of course, got some of the equipment, a lot of the equipment, as well as the Soviets, and they 
basically took those apart and started going from there, if, if I understand what mainstream history is telling us correctly. So we get all the way up to 1957 is when Sputnik gets launched, but actual lunar exploration is going to start in 1959 with Luna 1 by the Soviets, which was the first spacecraft said to reach the vicinity of the Earth's moon and the first spacecraft to be placed in heliocentric orbit. It was intended as an impactor, and it was launched as part of the Soviet lunar program beginning in 1959, but ran all the way into the 70s. However, due to an incorrectly timed upper stage burn during its launch, it missed the moon in the process of becoming the first spacecraft to leave geocentric orbit. But as Crow has been saying, if there's any reality to the way he presents space, this, of course, just didn't happen at all the way they say. Well, it's always it's always failure. A mechanical failure is always the, the fallback. I mean, look what the Chinese are doing right now. Supposedly, the Chinese have a robot on the moon right now, a rover. Um, and as soon as the images began to come back, people started ripping them apart. And almost immediately, we had equipment failure. Um, how, how is it that in the 60s, we can put men on a rocket that's going to travel many sp- times the speed of a rifle bullet. It's going to go 17,500 miles to escape the supposed gravity um, of this world and the explanation NASA gives us. You know, So basically, people are going to get on the nose of a thing that goes many times faster than a rifle bullet. They're going to go to the moon. They're going to come back safely. And yet, we can't even get a robot. And in the meantime, the United States has supposedly landed numbers of robots on Mars which is a hell of a lot further. The the endeavor and the way they describe it is many times as Herculean, uh, which I also don't accept. But my point is this. Um, We always see the equipment failure come into things, in my view, when they don't want to have to maintain the nonsense that they're putting out there into the mainstream. Uh, Early on, most people can go back and look at this. Even the color of the images that China was supposedly beaming back, all of it. There was very little of it that didn't come under immediate attack. And then, of course, that equipment failure came to bear pretty quickly. But, you know, all the way back in 1959, here we are. You know, we're going to put things in orbit. Well, where the heck are we now, man? Are we in the space age? Do we have quantum computing capability? Do we have all these things that would probably make any endeavor we attempted in the late 50s and early 60s, you know, like a cakewalk to the abilities we can bring to bear now, I would suggest logically that's what we should suspect. And it's not what we see at all. What we actually see is it's many times harder for some reason now to do the things we did so offhand back in 68 and 69, you know, putting people on the moon, bringing them back. We, we don't seem to be able to do it anymore. And there's a reason for this, Jason. Anyhow. They have no more German scientists to work with them, Mr. President. <laughs> Among other things, I don't know, man, maybe maybe when Disney quit being on every Sunday night, they couldn't influence as many minds, so they gave up on it. I don't know, Jason. Um, it's just pretty clear that the entire narrative we've been handed uh, is so illogical as to be unacceptable. And it is astounding the number of minds that just still accept that we went to the moon, yet every shred of evidence that we did it is lost. All the photographic evidence, all the telemetry, everything is for some reason lost. Um, and that even sets aside the, the the silly things we know, like, did you know that when everyone got in front of their black and white TVs to watch the astronauts stand on the moon, you were looking at a camera pointed at a black and white CRT monitor because NASA was telling us they didn't have the technology to broadcast the signal. So they literally filmed what the world saw off of the screen of a tube television, a black and white tube television. Not even kidding. But anyhow, back to you. Let's also not forget what the uh, Mr. Virgin Galactic Sir Richard Branson said. Remember that? <laughs> Space is hard. Yeah. After, after what was it? I forget how many. Was it 14 years or something? <laughs> all, all they, so here we are in the modern era. And of course, we don't do Apollo anymore because America's not interested. We don't do space shuttles anymore because, well, whatever excuse you want to buy. Um, So we're going to privatize it. So one of the companies that's privatized is Mr. Sir Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic. And after I think, Jason, if I remember correctly, something like 14 or 15 years of trying to simply do this, to take a vehicle, put it up to the edge of space, drop it back down and have it be reusable in a week or two. I don't remember how quickly it had to be reusable. So here in the modern era, in the age of computers, in the age of technology, 
we can't even take people in a reusable craft to the edge of space and back down. Um, and when Branson blew up his last thing on the launch pad or whatever it is some years ago, they asked him, um, what's going on here? And he, he literally comments, turns out space is hard. Well, I'll tell you what, Mr. Branson, in 68, it wasn't that hard. In 68, they said, we're going to do this thing. And in like a year, year and a half, they did it. But now, for some reason, we can't seem to do much of anything. Uh, quite a conundrum. Well, uh, you remember back when we were doing the Space Fraud series and Virgin Galactic was at the tail end of that, we kept seeing all these setbacks by Virgin Galactic. Here's an article. I just happened to look it up just to see what where they're at from October 13th, 2017, so just two months ago. <laughs> Richard Branson won't fly in space in six months, Virgin Galactic president says. Virgin Galactic founder Richard Branson most likely won't be going to space in the next six months, despite his recent statement that he'd be very disappointed otherwise. Mike Moses, president of Virgin Galactic, said yesterday, which was October 12th, that while the company plans to have one of its Spaceship 2 suborbital vehicles reach altitudes of more than 50 miles above Earth's surface within the next three months, it's unlikely the passengers, including Branson, will be on board in less than half a year. Branson made his comments on October 2nd at the Nordic Business Forum in Helsinki. Moses addressed Branson's comments during a question and answer period following a presentation here at the International Symposium for Personal and Commercial Spaceflight. So as always, he's saying, like, we're going to do it at this amount of time, and then that amount of time comes up, and of course, it's just not happening. Man, the best tricks are the old tricks, and the best games are the old games. And this game is called Kick the Can. <laughs> man, it's he's got a lot of feet to kick that can. <laughs> you think, man? They just keep putting that can in the middle of the road, and they claim it's going to do this, that, and the other thing. Then someone comes out and kicks that can down the road a little bit further. It's a bit like the Mars missions, right? Um, we're never going to Mars. We're never going to the moon. Uh, we are in a sufficient age of technology, and we have been told a backstory that all the way back in the 60s, these things were doable. What you are looking at is the proof that we, in fact, live in a construct. Um, the problem with talking about these things in depth very far is there's going to be a lot of people out there that are very married to science and very married to the ideas that NASA has put out there. And it becomes a topic that is really difficult to put in the public forum and talk about without people screaming, yelling, spitting, kicking and pulling hair. And that's unfortunate, but it does not diminish for one moment the fact that scientism has defended a lie here. I would challenge any scientific organization listening to this to truly take on the moon landings from the Apollo era, truly take them on, take science, bring it to bear, and prove out, prove that we went there. Because as it stands now, we have zero proof. You'll see people say, well, wait a minute, what about the retro reflectors on the moon? Um, I invite anyone to go look up the one place left. I think it's in Texas, if I remember correctly. I don't know, Jason, I should be looking these things up. There is or was a couple years ago when I did the research this one place left that was doing lunar ranging with a laser. And in the government documents that we dug up around that they had been inspected recently and the government inspection had said this place provides no measurable valuable science and should be defunded immediately because they were paying it i forget a couple hundred thousand a year to do lunar ranger ranging which basically means it's like an observatory it supposedly shoots a laser up to hit the supposed reflectors that the apollo missions left on the moon and here is a government document saying we just reviewed the 200 grand or whatever it is we're spending here and there is no measurable valuable science being done here so let's get that straight if in fact there were ret retro reflectors up there and if in fact you could bounce a laser off it there would never be a day when that wasn't valuable information. It would constantly tell you the distance of this supposed space body from our world. It would tell us all kinds of things that could never, ever be summed up as not providing adequate or valuable science. So I don't really want to hear the retro reflector argument. And by the way, I've seen lunar ranging done. And what actually happens is this laser goes crack, 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 and it pulses out these lasers and like, I forget what it is, 2.5 seconds or five. I forget the time that return is. All of a sudden on the return time, you hear the computer go beep and someone goes, yep, we did it. We bounced a photon off the moon and it came back. Um, and I would again suggest there is no human, humanly possible way to verify what has just happened. 
What you're being told is that photons were blasted off in the gazillions at the moon and a few of them made it back and they caught one and the computer detected it. There's no way for a human being to ever verify what's going on there. But that sets aside the whole point I'm trying to make here. Um, when you have a place that does lunar ranging and the government comes in to look at the 200 grand or whatever it was allocating for this, uh, for the one or two places left doing it, and come up to the conclusion that no valuable science is being done here, it tells you a tale. Um, don't remember where I started and all that, Jason, but it's just kind of another brick in the fraudulent wall. Well, what's curious about that is that, uh, well, I've played with lasers before. I mean, I think just about everyone has these days because you can get them at a dollar store in this day and age. Your typical red laser breaks up between half a mile and a mile, and the, the cool green ones that you use for a lot of us astronomical stuff, those can go for a couple of miles, I think maybe up to five miles. And I think the most powerful ones are the uh, the bluish ones. But what power laser do you need to shoot at the moon and then and then have it come back and, and not be completely broke. I mean, think about that was a two hundred thirty seven thousand miles to the moon. <laughs> well, they're green lasers. I've seen them and I did the research on this when I found the government, you know, review documents saying that this is worthless. Why are we spending money on it at this point? And that was some years ago. But they're magic lasers, Jason. They can take <laughs> a laser. Um, they don't need every ounce of power from every grid in America to back those lasers. Um, and they can shoot a beam over a quarter of a million miles, 340 some thousand miles or whatever the average distance of the moon is. And here's the rub, though, as I was doing the research on the lunar ranging and actually when I saw it done, I asked, how do you know the photon you caught is the one you bounced off the moon? You know what they said? Because it's so monochromatic, we can tell. Um, it's nonsense. It's all nonsense. And that sets aside the common sense things like the astronauts claiming the surface of the moon was covered with three inches of basically baby powder. So if there was retro reflectors up on the moon, who's up there dusting them off every week? Anyhow, I'm going to set this whole thing aside. Um, it is what it is, and it doesn't take a lot of brain logic to understand that it doesn't hold water. I think they must have found that laser in room 237. <laughs> well, that's certainly where it resides now, anyhow, Jason. <laughs> so an another interesting little thing I came across while looking up the early lunar exploration data was a guy named Marcus Allen in the UK. I believe he was in Scotland. He filmed or took pictures of both Sputnik in 1957 and Luna 1 in 59. And there was an article that uh, was quoted in here. A wired press photograph entitled Rockets, Russian Rocket Sent into Outer Space, January 1959, First Rocket Fired at Moon, describes how the sodium gas cloud was photographed by Marcus Allen, or here it says Morris Allen, so I don't know if there was a typo there. The following text is taken verbatim from the reverse of a press photograph stamped Kemsley Newspapers, 6th January 1959, which is the way the British do it, by the way. They, they put the month and the day opposite to the Americans. The Russian rocket on its way to the moon. Mr. Morris Allen, 34-year-old freelance photographer, who was the first man to photograph the original Russian Sputnik, early this morning took this photograph of the moon rocket. He and his three assistants saw the rocket from King's Cat Hill near Dunfermline, Firthshire, just after 1 a.m. and held it in view for almost eight minutes. It appeared like a cloud on the horizon near the constellation Virgo, he said. We photographed it with three cameras and with a movie camera. It's emerged in the sky just over the horizon near Edinburgh, but it was a second or two before we, we realized what we had. The picture shows the lights of Edinburgh in the foreground. The rocket is seen as an illuminated cloud top center. Now, out of sheer curiosity, if you can answer this, is that even possible? Judging how small the satellites, if they were putting them up, would have been in this era. Well, let's take it apart. So first of all, from what you just read, it's not clear to me whether they're claiming he filmed the sodium gas cloud or the rocket. The first part sounds like he's filming gas coming out of a rocket. The second part sounds like he's filming something coming into view in the sky. So there's kind of some crossed wires in the description we're getting here. But let's think about it for a second. If we're to consider, you know, if you go to try to look up where space starts, now there's another conundrum for you. No one seems to know exactly where space starts. Um, although there are ideas like the Kármán line and these other things, I guess, as, as close as I can tell from all the places that I've looked, it is claimed that space starts at roughly 60 to 100 miles over your head or something like that. Um, and I'm, again, I'm pulling from memory, but it's in that vicinity. 
The low Earth orbit is usually sighted at around 200, 250 miles above our heads. So let's think about it. You know, you've seen the Sputnik. Um, you know, it's it's like what a basketball or something. It's not that big. I don't know if a basketball is a good analogy, but the point is, is a person could pick it up. Um, it's not that big. So could you take a camera? Uh, if there was no atmosphere, if it was the clearest day possible and you didn't have all the pollution in the air that you have to look through on Earth, or, or even if you could just look straight up that far, could you film something that size at 250 miles away from you? And the other problem is, is with so many of the things I've tried to film when I was trying to verify whether or not satellites exist, you see these lights going through the sky in a perfectly straight line over your head, you're told it's a satellite. And as I began to take that apart, I began to realize, well, how can it be if I see a, from horizon to horizon this little light going through the sky, and that is supposedly reflecting sunlight, how can it be evenly reflecting sunlight the entire time? But here you're seeing uh, that he picked it up with three cameras, and it emerged near a horizon in Edinburgh. Um, a second or two later, you know, da, 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 it goes on and on, and they picked it up for so many minutes, I would suggest. Um, is that a possible thing? The Sputnik was not that big, and if we were to accept that most things in low Earth orbit are roughly 200, 250 miles an hour by the NASA claims or the space agency claims, is that a possible thing? And I would suggest that it's not. And even if something was very well lit because it was reflecting sunlight, how is it that it would be a constant light source? Everybody knows that if you see something like a plane that's going to reflect sunlight, it glints, it becomes very bright, and then it diminishes. Um, and that's just a plane going on its way. That's not a thing in supposed outer space on a parabolic arc, um, I would argue. So you tell me, Jason, can you film something that a human being could hold at 250 miles away because it's reflecting sunlight? I say no. Wasn't that also the problem that uh, with people trying to get the ISS was that it was just moving so fast? Well, people have shot. You see, here's the problem with the ISS is there is a light there that roughly matches um, the times that you're told it will be visible. They even have apps that will show you. I've seen it through binoculars and it even appears through binoculars where you've got kind of a 3D view because with binoculars, you can track something going fast pretty stably if, you, if you're good with binoculars, which I am from all the years of practice I've had. Um, and it does tend to have a shape of some sort. Um, I had a honking pair of binoculars on a tripod that I tracked it with, um, and that's not as good as a telescope. There are lots of people out there who have filmed the supposed ISS, and it looks to be the shape of what you're told. The problem is I don't know any of these people, and I have never been able to get my scope um, to film good enough footage on something moving that quick because telescopes aren't really made for it. There are people out there claim they do it. Here's what I can tell you. There's a light there. There's no doubt there's a light there. There are people tell you that that light resolves to something that is shaped in the way you should suspect. But with all the other problems that we have pointed out around the ISS, I'm sorry, man, a light in the sky does not make a space station. It just doesn't. There are too many problems, and so it makes that whole thing un unacceptable. The short answer is this. Until someday when I either get skilled enough to move my scope and hit something moving that quickly with my aperture and everything set right to knock down the surface brightness. All I can tell you is there's a light in the sky. And everything else you see posted online, I guess you have to decide whether you trust the source or not. For my part, I need to know the people. I need, like Randy in Houston. If Randy in Houston shot something and he told me, I would understand the man is telling me a true thing. Um, if I shot it myself, I would understand that whatever it is was done in the way it was done. But other than that, in my view, there's no International Space Station, but there is, in fact, a light or something uh, that is roughly equivalent to the times that will match when it's supposed to be in view. What I'm curious about is, and I'm sure a lot of people would like to hear this as well, if the way you suggest, and a lot of others do suggest this as well, that the mainstream notion of space is not as we're told, but is indeed some sort of liquid, and there's a hard, fast barrier of sorts, that would mean that these objects are in the upper atmosphere, correct? That's right. You know, so many people, like right now, um, so many people are running my old footage. When my channel got taken out, so many people downloaded um endless clips. And a lot of the people are saying, oh, these are UFOs, these are aliens. To be perfectly clear, in my view, I never shot anything that I would consider anything but terrestrial human made technology. Um, for the longest time, I was still considering way back in the day that there could be satellites. And as I began to take it apart and get more and more years of filming under me, I came to understand that there are no satellites. It finally came to a head 
when the Huffington Post covered one of the objects I had shot, got a FBI expert, which I don't know why the FBI knows anything about telescopes, and the head of MUFON. And what they said is Crow doesn't understand his equipment very well. Um, clearly what he's shot here is a satellite in half geosynchronous orbit. So everyone understands geosynchronous orbit. Oh God, I can't even remember these numbers now. I don't know. There's something like 22,000 miles above the surface of the Earth supposedly is geosynchronous orbit, which basically means that it's at the right distance so that it's constantly roughly over the same spot on Earth as everything spins in the or in the spinning orbital model. OK, they claimed what I shot was clearly a satellite and half geosynchronous because it was moving along slowly. And so that would mean it was roughly 11,000 miles away. So I got tired of people telling me I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't understand my equipment, and I got with one of the smartest optics people I had ever met in my life, who was basically a mathematical genius. This is what he did. He took the telescope I used, the camera I used, and he calculated out exactly what the width of a pixel would be at 100 miles, at 11,000 miles, at 22,000 miles, at the supposed distance of the moon at roughly a quarter of a million miles. And we figured out what the actual width of a pixel would be. When we had done this, I went back on the footage the Huffington Post had run and determined that if, in fact, this thing was 11,000 miles away or half geosync, as they were claiming, uh, it would be roughly four times the size of the International Space Station. These are nonsensical things. As I began to review, and I had two cameras at the time and two different scopes set up, so we did the measurements for both, and I began going through footage, and that's when I came to realize that nearly everything I had filmed, or certainly everything I had filmed, was much closer to us than I had previously supposed. None of it could be characterized as being in what we call space, and almost all of it is certainly within our atmosphere. So there's the labored ex explanation, Jason. And what I'd be curious about with someone who can do the, that kind of math is if indeed Apollo did what it did and the distances are as they say, what megapixel camera would you need to be able to zoom in enough to actually see the remnants of the lander? I'd be very curious if such technology exists and if so, can we take a picture of it? I'm quite certain the answer is no, but... <laughs> well, that's another thing, Jason. You know, the, they've told half-truths there. Um, they used to there it used to be con like when I started astronomy in the mid 90s the idea was that the best telescopes on earth could only see something that was I forget a mile across or a mile and a half across and as I got involved with the guy I just described to you who actually did such a good job that he calculated the the width of these pixels whether I was shooting a still or shooting video because the resolution of the image is different in both of those two cases. I came to understand that by the calculations we did, I could see well under a mile something on the moon with my, I think at the time it might have been a 12-inch telescope, I forget, um, and, and my good camera, um, that those old things we'd been told all those years as amateur astronomers, they weren't true. I would suggest that it is possible to have something terrestrially based um, with the technology we have today to begin to detect the supposed remnants of what we're told that Apollo left behind. As an example, there are supposed buggy tracks that go something like seven miles. How could you not resolve something like that? I mean, come on, man. Think about it. Think about what we're saying here. Um, it, it's a bit like, oh, the, the Great Wall of China is visible from space, all these other things we're told. And while I would have to get back to that portion of the research I did, because I remember thinking about these very ideas, I remember coming to the conclusion that with the technology we had now, you should be able to prove out certain things. And then what happened was the whole Hubble Space Telescope supposedly got pointed at the moon, um, and it took all of about two days before people demonstrated why those supposed Hubble images of the Apollo flag and other things left on the moon were fraud. Uh, and those that was bulletproof work that was done there, too. But anyhow, we've kind of wandered here, Jason. Well, we're also over the top of the hour here. So these are the things that we've, we discussed last time with the space fraud, that what we're finding, especially what you're finding, are inconsistency after inconsistency after inconsistency. And we just want to know, like we always do, we want to know what the truth is. We want to challenge these, these mainstream notions and say, okay, so what's really going on here? Because we're using amateur-grade equipment and finding data that does not correlate with some, some organization that has billions of dollars worth of budget every year.
Well, in, in my view, Jason, what's going on here is a dream has been woven um, because our environment, this place, this construct we live is purposely misdescribed. Um, people ask why all day long. I wish I could answer that. I wish I could show you a true image of where we are. I can't do these things. Um, but on, at the same time, you know, every one of us turns on the radio and we hear songs like Bowie and Queens Under Pressure. You know, listen to some of the lines out of that song. It's the terror of knowing what this world is about. Watching some good friends scream, let me out. There are endless references to this place that when you hear them, you think, well, that doesn't have any common sense usage in the world I'm used to. It must just be entertaining music. I would suggest to you that it is something more. I would suggest to you that space is misdescribed, that there is a hard, fast barrier at roughly the edge of what we call our atmosphere, that no man or machine has ever left our atmosphere. And this is based on many years of research and logical deduction based on some of the things we're talking about here. The problem is very simple. Whenever you begin to scrutinize any little portion of supposed space endeavors, they don't hold water. They will not add up. You cannot balance the ledger sheet. And this problem creeps into other problems, like the problems with science. How is it that we can be so reliant on science in the modern age, but have such a scientism-based scientific community that none of them are willing to challenge the Apollo missions? Go ahead. Walk into any scientific place in this world and say, can we please challenge the Apollo missions? And what you're going to hear is no, out of hand. That's not science. You see, we're told science is here to challenge everything, and it comes back empirically one way or the other, brothers. It's a one or it's a zero. There is no gray area. This is science. Well, I'm here to tell you there's a huge gray area. If you can't get somebody to use things like science, which are the acceptable tools of the day, to go back and challenge a thing, well, then what do you have? What you have is stories, histories, movies, belief systems, legends, mythos. That's what we have left. So, again, for the record, anyone out there in a science-based reality that wants to go and challenge the moon landings or the fact that there's an international space station up orbiting us right now with people in it, um, go do it. And what you're going to find is, is that you can't balance the ledger. And uh, it's not really arguable. I've done it myself. I'm a human being. I have a higher human mind. I have every ability everyone else does in this world if I set my mind to a thing. And I have set my mind to some of these things. And what I find is you cannot balance the ledger. But anyhow, we are past the top of the hour. Jason, is there anything you want to add? Hour two, we're going to get into just some more exploring of what was said was done in these early space programs, or excuse me, in this early lunar exploration of the space in the space programs. And then we're going to look at the effects in media that all this moon madness had in the, especially the late 1960s and all the way up to today. Right. So, you know, uh, part, part of where we're going to go here, too, is we're, you know, when he's re referring to media, we'll draw from some songs, you know, and I, I would suggest that you've been told the truth a heck of a lot of times. It's just delivered to you in a way that you think is entertainment or creative writing or something like that. So as we close this episode, I will reiterate what we have heard so many times. Space may be the final frontier, but it was made in a Hollywood basement. Truer words were never spoken. And in 1966, we got Star Trek. And that's really where the image of what space is started to enter the common collective mind. Anyhow, that brings episode 85, the first hour to a close. Join us over at Crow 777 Radio for the second hour. There, are, At the posting of this episode, there will be 85 free hours of content on Pro Triple Seven Radio. If you want to come grab the free content, that's great. If you want to support the free speech we endeavor to deliver, come be a member. Anyhow, that's it for episode 85, hour one. Join us at CrowTriple7Radio.com. Cheers. <laughs>